Welcome to Audio Rama on Delectora. Make yourself comfortable, listen, and enjoy to unlocking the mysteries of existence. Metaphysics for Everyone Audiobook by Connie Mendez. Chapter 1 Dynamic Christianity. Before undertaking any trade, the candidate who is to perform it receives instructions, or studies the technique of it. However, there is one who undertakes his task totally blind, without instructions, without technique, without compass, compass or design, without notions of what he will find. It is the human being, who is thrown to the task of living. Without even knowing what life is, without knowing why some lives, are spent in the midst of opulence and satisfaction, while others are spent in misery and suffering. Some begin with all the advantages that affection can devise, and yet they are pursued by a shortcut of calamities. The human being struggles in conjectures, all erroneous, and the day of his death arrives, without him having even guessed the truth about all this. Learn the great truth, what you think is manifested, thoughts are things. It is your attitude, that determines everything that happens to you. Your own concept is what you see, not only in your body and in your character, but outwardly, in your living conditions, in the material, yes, just as you hear it. Thoughts are things, and now you will see it. If you have the habit of thinking, that you are of a healthy constitution, whatever you do, it will always be healthy. But you change your way of thinking, you let yourself be instilled with the fear of disease, and then you start to get sick. You lose your health. If you are born into wealth, you may always be rich. Unless someone, convinces you that there is destiny, and you start to believe that yours can change, according to the, blows and setbacks, because you are believing so. Your life, what happens to you, obeys your beliefs, and what you express in words. It is a law, a principle. Do you know what a principle is? It is an invariable law that never fails. This law is called the principle of mentalism. If in your mind is rooted the idea, that accidents lie in wait for us at every step, if you believe that, the infirmities of old age, are inevitable, if you are convinced of your bad luck or good luck, then it is the principle of mentalism. Whatever you normally expect, for better or worse, that is the condition you will see manifest in your life, and in everything you do. That is the reason for what happens to you every day. We are never conscious, of the ideas that fill our mind. They are formed according to what we are taught, or what we hear people say. Since almost everyone is ignorant, of the laws that govern life, the so-called laws of creation, almost all of us spend our lives, creating conditions that are contrary to them. Watching that which promised to be so good turn bad, groping, as it were, blindly, without compass, rudder or compass. Attributing our ills to life itself, and learning by dint of blows and blows, blaming this to, the will of God. With what you have read so far, you will have realized that the human being is not what you have been led to believe, that is, a cork in the middle of a storm, tossed here and there according to the waves. Nothing of the sort. His life, his world, his circumstances, everything that happens to him, everything that happens to him, are his own creations and no one else's. He is the king of his empire. He is the king of his empire, and if his opinion is, precisely, that he is but a cork in the middle of a storm, then so be it. He has believed it and allowed it. To be born with free will means to have been created, with the individual right to choose. To choose what? To think negatively or positively. Pessimistic or optimistic. Thinking ugly and bad, which produces ugly and bad, or thinking good and beautiful, which produces good and beautiful, outwardly or inwardly. Metaphysics has always taught that what we think often passes into the subconscious, and settles there, acting as a reflection. Modern psychology has finally discovered it. When the human being is involved in the effects of his ignorance, that is to say, that he has produced himself a calamity, he turns to God, and begs him to free him from suffering. Man sees that God sometimes attends to him, and that at other times, inexplicably, 
he does not attend to him. In the latter case, it is when his relatives console him by telling him, we must resign ourselves to God's will. In other words, everyone takes it for granted that the will of the Creator is evil. But at the same time, religion teaches that God is our Father. An all-loving, kind and merciful Father. All wisdom and eternal. Do you see the lack of harmony between these two theories? Does it seem common sense to you that an all-loving and infinitely wise father could feel and express ill will towards his children? We, mortal fathers and mothers, would never be able to attribute to any child the crimes that we attribute to God. We would not be able to condemn a child to eternal fire for a natural fault of his mortal condition, and we consider that God is capable of it. That is to say, that without our realizing it, we are attributing to God, a nature of capricious, vindictive tycoon, full of ill will. He is waiting for our slightest infraction, to punish us out of all proportion. It is natural to think this way when we are born, we live ignoring the rules and the basic laws of life. We have already said the reason of our calamities. We produce them with our thoughts. In this, we are, image and likeness, of the Creator, we are creators. The creators, each one of his own manifestation. Now, why is it that God seems to attend sometimes, and sometimes not? You will see. Prayer is the purest and highest thought that can be thought. It is to polarize the mind, in the highest positive degree. They are vibrations of light that we launch when we pray, that is, when we think of God. These vibrations have to transform instantly, in perfect and beautiful, all the dark conditions that surround us, as when a lamp is taken to a room that is in darkness. As long as the one who is praying thinks and believes that the God to whom he is asking is a loving Father, who wishes to give all good to his child. In that case, God always attends. Although usually, mankind has the habit of asking like this, Oh, Papa God, get me out of this predicament, that I know that you will think that it does not suit me, because you want to impose this test on me. In other words, he has already denied any possibility of receiving it. He has more faith in the God who taught us, capricious, vindictive, full of ill will, who is only waiting for us to commit the first infraction, in order to inflict on us punishments of satanic cruelty. For he who thus asks, receives only according to his own image of God. It is as simple as I tell you. Now do not ever forget that God's will for you is good, health, peace, happiness, well-being, all the good that he has created. Never again forget that God is neither the judge, nor the policeman, nor the executioner, nor the tyrant that you have been led to believe. The truth is that he has created seven laws. Seven principles, which work in everything and always. They do not rest for a single minute. They are responsible for maintaining order and harmony, in all creation. No policemen are needed in the spirit. He who does not march with the law, punishes himself. What you think is manifested, so learn to think correctly and with the law, so that all the good that God wants for you is manifested. St. Paul said, that God is closer to us, than our feet and our hands, even more than our breath, so that we do not have to cry out to Him to hear us. It is enough to think of Him, so that what seems to be broken down can begin to be put back together. He created us. He knows us better than we can know ourselves. He knows why we act in this or that way, and does not expect us to behave like saints, when we are just learning to walk in this spiritual life. I am going to beg you not to believe anything I am telling you, without first checking it out. It is your divine and sovereign right. Do not do what you have done up to now, accept everything you hear and everything you see, without giving yourself the opportunity to judge between right and wrong. Chapter 2 The Mechanics of Thought All day and all night, we are thinking an infinity of different things. It passes through our mind, a kind of constant cinematographic film, although disconnected. Among so many different ideas, we stop to contemplate, examine or study, some more than others. 
Why? Because they have stimulated our feelings. They have produced in us a feeling of fear or antipathy, of sympathy or pity, a feeling of liking or disliking, it doesn't matter. The fact is that because of that feeling, the idea interests us, we review it later, perhaps we comment it with someone. This is meditating, and what is meditated in this way, is introduced in the subconscious and recorded there. Once an idea is recorded in the subconscious, it becomes a reflex. You know that when the doctor taps you on the knee, your leg jumps. You have been touched a sensitive point, and that's why you've reacted, haven't you? In the same way, every time something happens in your life that refers to one of the ideas that are engraved in your subconscious, the reflex reacts, in the exact way it was engraved. You adopt an attitude, according to the original feeling you felt, when you first thought of that idea. Metaphysicians call this a concept, that is, a belief, a conviction. The subconscious is not discerning. It does not decide anything, it does not give an opinion or think for itself. It has no power to protest, it has no will of its own. These are not its functions. Its only function is to react by putting into order the reflex that has been given to it. He is, in this sense, a wonderful filing cabinet, secretary, or automatic librarian, who neither rests nor fails ever. He also has no sense of humor. He does not know when an order was given as a joke or seriously. In such a way, that if Tuner is, is a little bulky, and if you, to make others laugh, you adopt the joke of calling it, my stuffed potato nose, for example. As the subconscious is an exact servant, has no sense of humor, and only knows how to obey unconditionally, it will try by all means to fulfill the order, which has been given to him in your words and your feeling. Then you will see how your nose, starts to look more and more like a stuffed potato. The word metaphysics means, beyond the physical, that is, the science that studies and deals with everything that is invisible to the physical senses. It gives you the reason for everything that we do not understand, for everything that is mysterious, for everything that has no obvious explanation, and it is exact, as you will see as you read this book. Now you will see, do you remember the first time you mentioned the word, cold? You don't remember, do you? You were very little. Your elders said the word, and they taught you to fear it. By dint of repeating it you were instructed to understand it, they told you not to get your feet wet, not to stand in a draft, not to go near someone, because they had a cold and it would stick to you, etc. etc., etc. All of which was recorded in your subconscious, and formed a reflex. You never had to remember the warnings of your elders. The damage was done. From then on, your subconscious has given you a cold, the best it can give you, every time you have placed yourself in a draft. As well as every time you got your feet wet, or every time you approached a cold, and every time you heard that there was an epidemic of flu or cold. Because of your elders, because of what you have heard others say, because of what you have read in newspapers and advertisements, on radio and television. And above all, because you ignore the metaphysical truth of life, you have accepted these stereotyped ideas, which have become reflexes that act without your premeditation, automatically. Reflexes that are the cause of all the evils that afflict you in the picture of your life. You have a bulky load of foreign ideas, which affect all departments of your life, your body, your soul and your mind. Notice that if you had not accepted it, if by the right that gives you your free will to choose, accept and reject, you would not have accepted the negative. There is no germ, virus or power in the world that could have attacked or convinced your subconscious to act in any other way than the one you gave it. Your will, negative or positive, is the magnet that attracts to you the germs, the adverse circumstances or the good ones. As we have already said, your negative or positive attitude to the facts, determine the effects for you. Chapter 3 The Infallible Formula It remains that every human mind contains an accumulation of opinions, convictions or misconceptions, contrary to truth, 
and in conflict with the basic principles of creation, which are perennially manifesting. Which are perennially manifesting, in external conditions, all those calamities and sufferings, which afflict the human being and the world in general. Diseases, accidents, ailments, quarrels, disharmonies, shortages, failures and even death. Happily, none of this is in accordance with the truth of being. Fortunately, there is a way to erase all these false beliefs, and replace them with correct ones, which not only produce positive, good, happy and correct conditions and circumstances. But once the error is corrected, and the truth is established in the subconscious, negative things can never happen again in our lives. The order has been changed, and the magnet has changed its pole. It is absolutely impossible to attract anything that does not already find its correspondence in us. The infallible formula is the following, every time something undesirable happens to you, that you get sick, that an accident happens to you, that you are robbed, that you are offended, that you are disturbed. Or that you are the cause of some evil towards another or towards yourself. If you are afflicted by a physical, moral, or character defect, if you dislike someone, if you detest them, or if you love too much and suffer because of this. If you are tortured by jealousy, if you fall in love with someone who belongs to another, if you are the victim of injustice, or are the victim of another's domination. The list is endless, so substitute for the condition that is affecting you. Know the truth. Thus Jesus Christ, the greatest of all masters of metaphysics, said, Know the truth and it will set you free, Gospel of St. John, 832. Truth, the supreme law is perfect harmony, beauty, justice, freedom, health, intelligence, wisdom and love. All the opposite is appearance. It is contrary to the supreme law of perfect harmony, therefore it is a lie, because it is contrary to truth. Your higher self is perfect. At this moment and always has been perfect, and it cannot get sick, because it is life. It cannot die for the same reason. It cannot grow old. It cannot suffer or feel fear. It cannot sin, and it does not have to fight either. It is beautiful, it is love, intelligence, wisdom and bliss. That is the truth. It is your truth, mine, that of all human beings, and right now. It is not that the human being is God. Just as a drop of sea water, it is not the sea. But it contains all that it forms, and just like the sea, to an infinitesimal degree, and to an atom, that drop of water is a sea. Whatever you are manifesting, whatever is happening to you contrary to perfect harmony, or whatever you yourself are doing or suffering, contrary to perfect harmony. All this is due to an erroneous belief that you yourself created, you know, and that you are reflexively throwing out and attracting its equal from the outside. It has nothing to do with your higher self. It continues to be perfect. Your conditions and your situation are perfect. Now, in each of the circumstances listed above, you must remember what I have just told you, first, and then say mentally or out loud, as you wish, I do not accept it. Say it firmly, but with infinite gentleness. Mental works do not need physical force. Neither thought nor spirit have muscles. When you say, I do not accept it, do it as if you were saying, I do not accept it. Do it as if you were saying, I don't feel like it, calmly, but with the same conviction and firmness. Without shouting, without violence, without a movement and without abruptness. Do I make myself understood? After having said, I do not accept it, remember that your higher self is perfect, and that its conditions are perfect. Now say, I declare that the truth of this problem is. Harmony, love, intelligence, justice, abundance, life, health, etc. Whatever is the opposite of the negative condition, which is manifesting at that moment. Thank you Father, you heard me. You do not have to blindly believe, this you are reading. You must see for yourself. 
In metaphysical language, this is called, a treatment. After any treatment, you have to keep the attitude that you have declared. One cannot allow doubt to enter, regarding the efficacy of the treatment, nor can one re-express in words the concepts, opinions and beliefs of before, because it destroys, nullifies the treatment. The purpose is to transform the mental pattern, which has been dominated in the subconscious, that is, the mental climate in which you have been living, with all its series of negative circumstances. St. Paul said, You are transformed by the renewing of your mind, Romans 12:2. This renewal is done by changing every old belief, as it comes before our life, or our conscience, into knowledge according to the truth. There are convictions that are so deeply rooted, that they are what is called in metaphysical language, crystallizations. These require more work than others. But every denial and affirmation that is made in regard to these crystallizations erases the original design until it disappears altogether and nothing remains but truth. You will see the miracles that occur in your life, in your environment and in your conditions. You have no defects but the appearance of defects. What you see as moral or physical defects are transitory. When you know the truth of your true self, your Christ, your higher self, who is perfect as a child of God, and is made in the likeness of the Father, the imperfections that you are showing to the world, fade away. This is a verifiable fact. Every student of Christian metaphysics can corroborate what I have just told you. This is the great truth. Never forget it. Begin at this very moment to put it into practice, for the more you practice it, the more it will materialize, the more you will advance, and the more happiness you will experience. Remember. You are unique, like your fingerprints. You were created by a unique design, for a special purpose, which no one else but you can fulfill. It has taken you 14,000 years to evolve to where you are today. God's expressions are infinite. You and I are only two of those infinite expressions. Your Christ is an intelligent being, who loves you with delirium, and who has centuries waiting for you to recognize Him. The time has come. Speak to Him, ask Him, and wait for His answers. When you come to understand, accept and realize this truth, it will be the birth of Christ for you. It is what is prophesied for this age. He is the Messiah. It is not that Jesus is born again now, it is that everyone will find the Christ, in his conscience and in his heart, just as it happened to Jesus. That is why they called him, Jesus Christ. Chapter 4 The Decree Every word that is pronounced is a decree that manifests itself outwardly. The word is the spoken thought. Jesus said two things which have not been taken seriously. One was, by your words you will be condemned, and by your words you will be justified. This does not mean, that others will judge us by what we say, although this is also true. As you may have already seen, the Master taught metaphysics, only the race was not yet mature enough to understand it. On several occasions he warned, saying that he had still many other things to say, but they could not be understood. On other occasions, he said that he who had ears to hear, should listen. The second reference he made to the power of the word, was, It is not what goes into his mouth, that defile a man, but what comes out of his mouth, for what comes out of the mouth, proceeds from the heart. It cannot be expressed more clearly. I propose that you pay attention to all that you say in a single day. Let's remind you. Business is very bad. Things are very bad. Youth is lost. Traffic is impossible. The service is unbearable. You can't get service. Don't leave that there because it will be stolen. Thieves are robbing at every corner. I'm afraid to go out. Watch out, you're going to fall. Careful, you'll kill yourself. You're going to break that. I have very bad luck. I can't eat that, it hurts me. My bad memory, my joy, my headache, my rheumatism, 
my bad digestion. That's a bandit. That one is a wretch. Do not be surprised and do not complain, if you see it happening by expressing it, then you have decreed it. You have given an order that has to be carried out. Now remember and never forget that every word you say is a decree, no matter if it is positive or negative. If it is positive it manifests in good. If it is negative, it is manifested in evil, and if it is against your neighbor, it is the same as if you were decreeing it against yourself. That is returned to you. If it is kind and understanding towards others, you will receive kindness and understanding from others towards you. And when something annoying, negative, unpleasant happens to you, do not say, but I did not think or fear that this would happen to me. You must have the honesty and modesty to reflect, on how you refer to your fellow men. At what point did an old, ingrained concept spring from your heart, which is perhaps nothing more than a social custom, like most of those mentioned above, and which you really do not wish to continue to use. The feeling that accompanies the thought, is what engraves it more firmly in the subconscious. The Master Jesus, who never used unnecessary words, wisely expressed, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. This statement gives us an unequivocal key, which reveals the first feeling we are taught, fear. It is taught to us first by our parents, and then by our religious teachers. When we feel fear, our heart races. We usually say, my heart almost jumped out of my mouth, to show the degree of fear that we feel at a given moment. Fear is what is behind all the negative phrases I have quoted above. St. Paul said, we are transformed by the renewal of our minds. When you utter a negative phrase, you will be able to identify the misconception, which is rooted in your subconscious, and thus know its associated feeling, fear or lack of love. Face that thought, reject it as a lie, and affirm the truth, if you no longer wish to manifest it in your external reality. After a short time of this practice, you will notice that your speech is different, and your way of thinking is different. You and your life will be transformed by the renewal of your mind. When you are in a meeting with other people, you will be perfectly aware of the kind of concepts they have, and you will notice them in everything that happens to them. Whenever you hear negative conversations, do not affirm anything they express think, I do not accept it, neither for me nor for them. You don't have to tell them. It is better not to divulge the truth that you are learning, not because you have to hide it, but because there is an occult maxim that says, when the disciple is prepared, then the master appears. By the law of attraction, everyone who is ready to go up a grade is automatically brought closer to the one who can advance him, so do not try to do the work of a catechist. Do not force anyone to receive lessons in the truth, for you may find that those whom you thought most willing are the least sympathetic with it. This is what Jesus meant when he said, Give not that which is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls in front of the pigs, lest they stomp on them, and then turn away, and then stop. Chapter 5 Faith moves mountains, why, and how. Everyone knows the saying, and repeats it often. They repeat it like a parrot, because they do not really know what it means, nor why or how it is that, that faith moves mountains. Few know that fear also moves mountains. Fear and faith are actually one and the same force. Fear is negative, and faith is positive. Fear is faith in evil. That is, the conviction that something bad is going to happen. Faith is the conviction that what is going to happen is good, or that it will end well. Fear and faith are two sides of the same coin. Take a good look. You never feel fear that something good is going to happen to you. Nor do you ever say, you have faith that something bad is going to happen to you. Faith is always associated with something we desire, and I do not believe that you desire evil for yourself. You fear it, don't you? Whatever you fear, you attract and it happens to you. Now when it happens to you, you usually say with a triumphant air, Aha, I knew it. I sensed it, and you run off to tell and repeat it, 
as if to show off your clairvoyant gifts. And what actually happened is that you thought it with fear. Did you sense it? Of course you sensed it. You are saying it yourself. Now you know, that whatever is thought while feeling an emotion, is what is manifested or attracted. You anticipated and expected it. To anticipate and expect, is to have faith. Now notice that everything that you expect with faith, comes to you or happens to you. So, if you know that this is so, what prevents you from using faith for everything you desire? Love, money, health, etc. It is a natural law, a divine ordinance. The Christ taught it in the following words, which you know, whatever you ask in prayer, and believing, you will receive. I did not invent it. It is in chapter 21, verse 22 of Matthew. And Saint Mark expresses it even more clearly, whatever you ask for in prayer, you must believe that you will receive it, and then it will come to you. Saint Paul says it in words, which have no other interpretation, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things hoped for, the conviction of things seen. Above I told you that faith is the conviction of what is good. Now I will tell you that conviction comes from knowledge. Suppose you live in the province, and you have never been to the capital. You want to go to the capital, and you take the train, the car, or the plane. You know where the capital is, and how to get there. One day you head for the capital, and you use the way of driving that suits you best, but on the way, you are not afraid of going off to the moon, no. If you were a wild Indian, you would have to take the train to the capital, and you would have to drive to the moon. If you were a wild Indian, you would probably be trembling with fear, because you are totally unaware of what is going on. But being a civilized person, you go calmly, knowing that at such and such an hour, you will reach the capital. What is it that gives you this faith? It is knowledge. Ignorance of the principles of creation, is what makes the world fear evil, does not know how to use faith, or even what it is. Faith is conviction and assurance, but these must be based on knowledge of something. You know that the capital exists, and you are going to it. That's why you know you're not going to end up on the moon. Now you know that when you desire something, if you fear not getting it, you will not get it. If you deny it before you receive it, as in the example of the prayer already given, which is addressed to God by the majority of human beings, my God, grant me such and such a thing, even though I know that you will not give it to me, because you will think that it does not suit me. Then you will not obtain it, because you have denied it beforehand. You have confessed that you do not expect it. Let me give you the metaphysical formula, to get whatever one desires. It is a formula, to be used for everything. See for yourself, and do not believe me blindly. I desire such a thing. In harmony for the whole world and in accordance with the divine will. Under grace and in a perfect way. Thank you Father that you heard me. Now do not doubt for an instant, for you have used the magic formula. You have fulfilled the whole law, and it will not be long before you will see your desire manifested. Be patient. The longer you wait, the sooner you will see the result. Impatience, tension, and mental prodding destroy the treatment, the formula is what in metaphysics is called a treatment. In order for you to know what you have done by repeating the formula, I will explain the process in detail. When you say, in harmony for the whole world, you have eliminated all danger of your convenience harming another, just as it is not possible for you to wish harm to another. When you say, in accordance with the divine will, if what you wish is less than perfect for you, you will see something much better happen than you expected. In this case it means that what you were desiring, you were not going to find sufficient, or it was not going to be as good as you thought. God's will is perfect. When you say, under grace and in a perfect way, it holds a wonderful secret. But let me give you an example of what happens when you don't know how to ask under grace and perfection. A lady urgently needed a sum of money, and she asked for it on the 15th of the month. She had absolute faith that she would receive it, 
but her selfishness and indifference did not inspire her to ask for it with any consideration for anyone else. The next day her daughter was hit by a car, and on the 15th of the month, she received the exact amount she had asked for. It was paid to her by the insurance company, because of her daughter's accident. She worked against the law, and against herself. To ask, under grace and in a perfect manner, is to work with the spiritual law. The law of God, which always manifests itself on the spiritual plane. There, on the spiritual plane, everything is perfect, without obstacles, without inconveniences, without stumbling blocks or harm to anyone. Without struggle or effort, all smoothly, all with great love, and that is our truth. That is the truth that when known, sets us free. Thank you, Father, that you have heard me, is the highest expression of faith that we can cherish. Jesus taught it, and applied it to everything, from the breaking of the bread with which he fed five thousand, to telling how to change the wine into his blood. Giving thanks to the Father, before seeing the manifestation. As you will see, everything Jesus taught was metaphysical. Whatever you desire, whatever you need, you can manifest. The Father has already foreseen everything, He has already given everything, but you have to ask for it as you feel the need. You only have to remember that you cannot ask for evil for another, because it is returned to you, and whatever you ask for yourself, you must also ask for all humanity, because we are all children of the same Father. For example, always ask for big things. The Father is very rich, and He does not like stinginess. Don't say, Oh, Papa God, give me a little house. I only ask for a little house, even a small one inch, when the reality is that you need a very big house, because your family is large. You will receive only what you ask for. Ask like this. Father, give me in all mankind, all the wonders of your kingdom. And now make your list. To strengthen your faith, make a list of things you want or need, and list the objects or things. Next to this list, make another one listing things you wish to see disappear, either in yourself or externally. On the same paper, write the formula I gave you above. Now, read your paper every night. You should not feel the slightest doubt. Every time you think of what you have written, say thank you again. As you see that the things you have listed are coming true, cross them out. And at the end, when you see them all done, don't be so ungrateful as to think, maybe they were going to be given to me anyway, because that's a lie. They were given to you because you asked for them correctly. The outside accommodated itself to let them pass you by. Since you are already very used to feeling fear for a variety of reasons, every time you find yourself attacked by a fear, repeat the following formula, which will erase the reflex that you have engraved in your subconscious. I am not afraid. I do not want fear. God is love, and in all creation there is nothing to fear. I have faith, and I want to feel faith. A great master used to say, the only thing to fear is fear. You should repeat this formula even when you are trembling with terror. And at that moment, all the more so. Only the desire not to fear, as well as the desire to have faith, is enough to cancel all the effects of fear, and to place us in the positive pole of faith. I suppose that you already know the psychological principle that says that when a custom is erased, it must be replaced by another. Every time an idea crystallized in the subconscious is denied or rejected, it is erased a little bit. The small emptiness that is thus created, must be filled immediately, with a contrary idea. Otherwise, the emptiness will attract ideas of the same kind, which are always suspended in the atmosphere, thought by others. Little by little you will see that your fears will disappear, if you have the will to be constant, repeating the formula in all the circumstances that arise. Little by little you will see that only things will happen as you wish them to happen. By their fruits ye shall know them, Jesus said. This great instrument, the power of decree, is presented to our attention, in that extraordinary story of creation, 
which we find in the first two chapters of Genesis, in the Bible. I suggest that you take time now, and read this wonderful story. As you read, you will realize that the human being, that is, you and I, was not conceived to be a peace, on the board of circumstances, nor a victim of conditions. Nor a puppet moved from one side to the other, by powers beyond his control. Instead, we find that man occupies the pinnacle of creation. And that, far from being the most insignificant thing in the universe is, by the very nature, of the powers given to him by his Creator, the supreme authority appointed by God, to rule the earth and every created thing. Man is endowed with the very powers of the Creator, because he is made, in his image and likeness. Man is the instrument through which the wisdom, love, life and power of the Creator Spirit is expressed in fullness. God placed man, in a responsive and obedient universe, including his body, his affairs and his environment, who has no alternative, but to carry into effect the edicts or decrees, of his supreme authority. The power to decree is absolute in man, the dominion God gave him, irrevocable. And although the basic nature of the universe, is good in the Creator's evaluation, it can appear to man only, as he decrees it to appear. We see that as long as man was obedient to his Creator, kept his power to think, and make decrees in tune, with the spirit of good which is the structure of creation, he lived in a universe of good, a Garden of Eden. But when man fell, by eating of the tree of knowledge, and using his powers in good and evil, something which as a free agent he could do, he immediately found sweat and thistles, mixed with his daily bread. Since the fall, man has been busy, declaring his world good or evil, and his experiences, have been according to his decrees. This clearly demonstrates how the universe responds, and how complete and far-reaching are man's dominion and authority. Chapter 6 Love You only need this chapter to finish knowing the first principle of creation, the principle of mentalism whose motto is, All is mind. Jesus Christ said, You are God's, Gospel of St. John, 1034. Just as creation, all of it, was a manifested thought, so man, who is a God in potency, creates with thought, all that he sees manifested, in equality in likeness of his Creator. This you have already learned. You have also learned the mechanics of this mental creation, the character, positive or negative, of the created, the force, faith or fear, which determines the character. As well as how to change the outward appearance of what you have created, denying and affirming. The power of the word, which is the spoken thought and therefore, confirms the orders you have given with your thoughts. And finally, the infallible formula for creating, manifesting and obtaining the best, the highest, and the perfect, knowing the truth, in obedience to the ordinance, of the Master Jesus. You know that this truth, is that we were created perfect by a perfect Creator, with the perfect essence of Himself, with free will to create positively or negatively. And therefore, evil, is not a creation of God. It has no power in the face of truth. It disappears when substituted for thought, and the positive word. Jesus said, Do not resist evil, Street Matthew, 539, that is, that we master evil with good. The only truth is the good. From now on, you will never again be able to blame anyone for what happens to you. You will have to look yourself in the face, and ask yourself, how was my mental climate in this circumstance? Was it positive or negative? Did I feel faith or fear? What kind of decrees have I launched with my words? By their fruits you shall know them. You will have to come clean and answer the truth. Are you pleased with what you are seeing? You will say. Now, in Christian metaphysics, we say that God has seven aspects, love, truth, life, intelligence, soul, spirit, and principle. You see, all these aspects are invisible states. Mental, then. We cannot see or touch them, we only feel and appreciate their effects. They exist, they act, they are real, they are things, 
and none of them can be denied. Love is called the character of God, the first aspect of God, the most powerful of all forces, and also the most sensitive. Few people know what love really is. Most believe that it is that which is felt, towards parents, children, spouses, lovers, etc. Affection, affection, attraction, antipathy and hatred are all different degrees of the same thing, feeling. Love is very complex, and cannot be defined with a single word, but since on our planet, it is understood by love sensation. And although this is only, as it were, the outer edge of love, let us try to bring sensation as close as possible to love, in order to begin to understand it. The central point on the scale, which goes from hatred to feeling, which we call here, love, is tolerance and goodwill. It seems a contradiction, but when one loves too much or too much, tolerance and goodwill are lacking. When one hates, tolerance and goodwill are also lacking. In other words, both excessive love and excessive unlove are the negation of tolerance and goodwill. Jesus said, Peace to men of goodwill. Which implies that whatever goes beyond that, does not bring peace. Peace is in the center, the perfect balance, neither more nor less, and so in everything. All the excesses, even the excess of good, excess of money, of love, of charity, of prayer, of sacrifice, etc., unbalance the weight of the scales, they lead more to one side, and take away peace. When Genesis says, of all the fruits of paradise you may eat, except of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it refers to precisely that. The tree trunk symbolizes the center, the balance. The branches start from that center, spreading out to all sides, and producing, fruits. Some manifest themselves as good, others as bad. They symbolize the extremes. You will see that, the forbidden fruit, which has caused so much tribulation in the world, is nothing other than extremes. The excess in all aspects, because God, who created everything, declared all his work good, read it in Genesis, and only mentions the word evil, with respect to the excess. I digress, to recommend you to read and meditate on the chapter of Ecclesiastes, which begins, Everything has its time. The Bible. Transcribed below, Everything has its time, and everything under heaven has its hour. A time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal. A time to destroy, and a time to build, a time to mourn, and a time to laugh. A time to reap, and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away. A time to break, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. What profit hath he that laboreth, of that wherein he toileth? I have seen the work that God has given to the children of men to do. He has made everything beautiful in its time, and has put eternity in their hearts, without man being able to understand the work that God has done from the beginning to the end. I have known that there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives, and also that it is the gift of God that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. I have understood that whatsoever God doeth, that shall endure for ever, there shall nothing be added thereto, neither shall any of it be diminished, and God doeth it, that men may fear before him. That which was, is already, and that which is to be, has already been, and God restores that which is past. Let us return to love. Those mothers who say they love their children so much that they do not allow them to leave the nest, nor to marry, nor to act independently of them when they are already men and women of age, do not love. They are selfish, and what they feel is desire for possession. Those girlfriends and wives, who suffer tortures of jealousy, do not love either. Those types of love, are nothing but excess of feeling. They exceed the measure, and therefore, 
they go far away from tolerance and goodwill. Usually, excess of sentiment, proves that there is lack of development of intelligence. This will undoubtedly cause indignation in those people, who fill their mouths saying they are very sentimental. Nobody likes to have their lack of intelligence revealed to them, but they can prove it. The excess of emotionality, like all excess, is bad. It is proof that there is a lack of what counterbalances it. The excess of heat, for example, is balanced by an equal amount of cold, to bring it to be bearable or unpleasant. Intelligence is cold, and emotion is warm. A great emotional capacity, is a magnificent and highly desirable quality, provided it is balanced, with equal intellectual capacity. This is what produces great artists. But the artist has his art, in which to overturn all his emotional power. On the other hand, the exaggeratedly emotional person, and with little intellectual development, overturns all his passion, in the human beings that surround him, pretends to tie them, and that they fulfill his whim. The remedy for excessive emotionality is to think and reflect a lot, especially to meditate. For a while and daily, about intelligence. Beginning by asking oneself, what is intelligence? Continuing by thinking that everything in the universe, plants, animals, etc. contains intelligence. And ending by affirming, I am intelligent, with the intelligence of God Himself, for I am created from the very essence of the Creator. By the intelligence, with the intelligence and from the intelligence of God. A few days after repeating this treatment, you will notice a change in elasticity and mental penetration. And with only one week of exercise, one can appreciate the transformation in the way of loving others, a serenity and a peculiar generosity, which one would never have believed oneself capable of expressing. At the same time, one notices a total change in others, towards oneself. This is because we are individuals, that is, indivisible, and what affects one, affects all. The step you climb, helps the whole race. We will now turn to the number one enemy of all mankind, resentment and rancor, not to say hatred. Few individuals are free of resentment, not realizing that it poisons their entire existence, negatively affects every manifestation, and is the cause of all the disappointments we experience. Even when we learn to practice denial and affirmation, to know the truth, and to watch and correct our thoughts and words. A single resentment, a grudge engraved in the subconscious and in the soul, act as a little fountain of gall, emanating its drop of bitterness, staining everything, and surprisingly contradicting our greatest longings. Nothing, not even the most perfect demonstration, can last as long as that infectious focus exists, spoiling our very being. The Bible, the churches and religions are tired of advocating forgiveness and love towards our enemies, and everything is in vain, as long as they do not teach us the practical way to impose forgiveness towards those who hurt us. Much is heard to say, I forgive but I cannot forget. Lie. For as long as one remembers a hurt, one has not forgiven it. We are going to give the infallible formula to forgive and forget at the same time, for our own convenience. For this establishes us at the central point of balance, that of tolerance and goodwill, and this effort being, love. St. John, the Apostle of Love says, Love is the fulfillment of the law. To fulfill the law of love is to fulfill all the laws. It is to be with God, in God, it is to be happy, satisfied and complete, in all our manifestations. My teacher used to say, the man who loves well, is the most powerful man in the world. And here is the recipe for loving well, every time you feel something disgusting towards another, or you find yourself resenting something that has been done to you. Or that you recognize an open resentment or a desire for revenge, deliberately start to remember, IT is not about trying to forget what happened now, IT is to remember all the good things you know about that person. Try to relive the pleasant moments that you enjoyed in his company in the past, before he hurt you. Insist on remembering the good things, his good qualities, the way you thought of him. If you manage to laugh at a joke he told, 
or it's something funny you enjoy together, the miracle has been done. If a single treatment is not enough, repeat it as many times as necessary, in order to erase the resentment or resentment. It is something you should do, up to seventy times seven. This is the fulfillment of the law given by Jesus, do not resist evil. This is turning the other cheek. It is to love our enemies, to bless those who curse us, to do good to those who hate us, and to pray for those who insult and persecute us, all without exposing ourselves to being trampled upon. If you do it with sincerity, you will realize something very strange, and that is that you will feel liberated, first of all. And then, that a mountain of small inconveniences that happen to you, and that you did not know what to attribute to, disappear as if by magic, and your life goes on rails. Besides, you will find yourself loved by everyone, even by those people who did not like you very much before. Chapter 7 Denials and Affirmations In the face of an own or an alien illness, I deny the appearance of any physical ailment. I do not accept it for myself or for anyone else. The only truth lies in the spirit, and all that is inferior conforms to my word, as I recognize the truth. In the name of Jesus Christ who authorized us, I decree that I and all are life. Life is health, strength and joy. Thank you Father that you have heard me. Against all fear, own or other I deny fear. God did not create fear, therefore it has no other existence than the one I want to give it, and I do not accept, I no longer desire this appearance created by me. I let go and let go of every shadow of fear in me, or in you. John the Apostle said, Love uproots all fear. God is love, I am his child, I am made of love. This is the truth. Thank you Father. In the face of all sadness, own or other I deny the very existence of this sadness, sorrow or depression, God does not authorize it. I erase in me all tendency to negativity. I do not need it and I do not accept it. God is bliss, joy and happiness. I am bliss, joy and happiness. Thank you Father for. Start listing everything you have, even the most insignificant. In the face of any lack or scarcity, I deny any appearance of scarcity. It is not the truth, I cannot accept it and I do not want it. The abundance of everything is the truth. My world contains everything. Everything is already provided for, given by an all-loving Father, I have only to claim my good. Show me the way, Father, speak that your child hears you. Thank you, Father. In favor of everything that is not harmonious, I deny inharmony. I do not accept this appearance of conflict. God is perfect harmony. In the spirit there is no clash, no contradiction, no strife, no struggle, nothing that opposes the fulfillment of perfect harmony. Thank you Father, I bless your harmony in this circumstance. For world peace, and against all contrary appearances, thank you Father that you are peace. Thank you Father that nothing that is contrary to this fact, has any consistency, that everything is the creation of those who ignore. Forgive them for they know not what they do. Thy will be done, here on earth as it is in you. Thank you Father. I give you all of the above, so that you may learn to formulate your own prayers. As all day long we are thinking and decreeing, all day long we are praying, negatively or positively, and creating our own conditions, states and events. The important thing is to stay in the mood that expresses the prayer. If after affirming you let yourself go back to the negative pole, you destroy the effect of the prayer. Watch your thoughts, and watch your words. Do not let yourself be dragged by what others express, remember that they do not know what you already know. What you think and ask for yourself, think also for others. We are all one in spirit, and that is the most effective way to give. Better than bread and alms, for bread and alms last but a few moments, while truth remains with the other forever. Sooner or later your spiritual gift will enter the conscious mind, and you will have done the work of salvation in a brother. 
The principle of rhythm, which is the law of the pendulum, the boomerang, returns to you the good you do, as well as the evil you do. It has been said that, one with God is the majority. So that a single person, who raises his consciousness to the spiritual plane, and recognizes the truth in the manner expressed above, is capable of saving an organization from ruin. As well as to save a community, a city, or a nation from crisis, because he acts on the spiritual plane, which is truth, and it dominates all the lower planes. Know the truth, and it shall set you free. Metaphysical meaning of the Ten Commandments of Moses It seems that it has not yet been ascertained whether Moses was what the Bible says, or whether he was really the son of an Egyptian princess, sister of Ramses II. His name means, drawn from the waters, in biblical symbolism. The Bible, for the most part, is composed of symbolic stories, which seek to safeguard the great truth, from misinterpretations by those, who do not possess sufficient maturity, to put it into practice. Therefore, it is very likely that the whole biblical narrative, related to his Hebrew birth and his adoption by the princess, is also symbolic and not historical. In any case, the truth of his origin does not affect what he taught. Moses was a great enlightened one, a great teacher of metaphysical truth, who not only liberated the Hebrew people from slavery, and the subhuman conditions in which they found themselves. But he also taught many wandering tribes, which were added to his group in the desert. And for this reason, it was that so many different races, descended from those tribes, acquired the monotheistic cult, one God, keeping it until today. Such a disparity of people, some of them totally primitive. Who did not know how to respect others, who killed others because they were bothered, who let the elderly perish because they represented to them, each one of them, one more mouth. For those for whom a woman was nothing but a female belonging to everyone. And others not so primitive, as the Jews who had lived slaves of the Egyptians, but had not known anything else, that the work from sunrise to sunset, without truce or rest. And that in the coexistence with the idolaters, they had adopted these beliefs, and forgotten the cult of their ancestors. This forced Moses to formulate a code of laws, simple and concise, to the mental level of all, expressed in almost childish language, although with very hard punishments for each infraction. Which were based on threat and terror, since this is the only way to tame a wild beast. Moses had been educated in the temple of Heliopolis, which was, as it were, a university. There he taught what they called geometry, at that time. This ancient wisdom encompassed not only mathematics, but also metaphysics, astrology, numerology, interpretation of numbers, and a threefold symbolism. Which was used by the ancients, to preserve their knowledge, at the service of the coming generations, as they advanced in their evolution. The first aspect of this symbolism was simple, it refers to the life and world of humans. The second aspect is metaphysical. It deals with the same condition, but on the mental plane. The third aspect is hieroglyphic, and deals with the same matter on the spiritual plane, and this last aspect is so profound, that it says it is not intelligible, but to pure spirits. And here is our first exposition, of the principle of correspondence, which says, as it is above, so it is below, as it is below, so it is above. Down, means, on the material plane, in human conditions, in the visible. Above, refers to the invisible, to the mental, and of course to the abstract, spiritual. What the principle of correspondence says, is that the laws act all on all planes, and that the conditions on one plane, are repeated on the higher plane, as well as on the lower plane. You will see this clearly from now on. Thus Moses elaborated his Ten Commandments, or Sefer Bereshit, as this code of laws is called in Hebrew language. And he did it so that humanity, as it evolved and awakened, would be initiated in the higher teaching. And the following interpretation is not the invention of any man. It was left in clues known to the very advanced, but kept hidden, through these millennia. As you will see later, mankind has already learned the first lesson, 
that is to say, it has already learned to obey the law in its first aspect. The majority is mentally and morally adult, there is a large sector of humanity, which is already protesting within. Because of the contradictions between dogma and common sense, and this is the signal, which indicates the time to take the step forward. The majority, then, begins to reason on a higher scale. In synthesis, the Ten Commandments say. 1. There is but one God. 2. Thou shalt not make images, thou shalt not worship or adore them. 3. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. 4. Remember to keep holy the seventh day. 5. Honor thy father and thy mother. 6. Thou shalt not kill. 7. Thou shalt not commit adultery. 8. Thou shalt not steal. 9. Thou shalt not bear false witness. 10. Thou shalt not covet. This group of laws is divided into two groups. Eight commandments appear to be prohibitions, and begin with the word, no. These are numbers 1, 2, 3, 6, 7, 8, 9 and 10. Numbers 4 and 5 are recommendations. At first glance, the human being who has not yet learned to reason on the mental spiritual plane, understands them as prohibitions, or rules of conduct. This was necessary, so that the vast majority of humanity would receive the news, and then get used to, not to kill, not to steal, not to lie, not to covet, to think of others, and the idea of one God. At the time of Moses, the population of the world was reduced to a number and a sector of the earth, relatively very small. However, in that small area and that small number, the great majority was totally ignorant, and the rest less ignorant, only counted some really advanced or educated. To the great human mass of today, it has cost tremendous blows and blows, individual and collective, to learn to behave habitually, according to the rules of ethics laid down by Moses. And even seen from above, we would say that it is not so. We would say that humanity continues to kill, steal and lie as if it were, but this is not the truth. It is not true, with respect to the great majority. The great majority, desires the freedom to worship the one God, as it pleases it best. The great majority no longer steals, nor kills. The great majority loves and cares for its elders. And finally, the whole earth, knows and fulfills the recommendation, to rest one day a week, Sunday. It is the minority that breaks the earthly laws. It is a very small minority which lives in prisons. It is the minority that does not know God. And finally, if there are still people who ignore that there is a thing called the law to punish those who behave badly, they are the great exception, which proves the progress of the majority. The time has come, then, for the great human majority to take the next step forward, that is, to receive and understand the second aspect of the aforementioned symbolic trilogy. The one that deals with the mental plane, because the third aspect, the hieroglyphic, we will not understand until we are clean of all error. When we can be catalogued as pure spirits, that is to say, when we have learned to love one another. And let's get to the point. The first three commandments, which are already covered in the principle of mentalism, are not to be unraveled until the end of the book. After exposing what is contained in commandments number 6, 8, 9 and 10, that is, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, and thou shalt not covet. To begin to make clear, the word, no, does not have the same intention of those posters, which we place in certain points of the cities, and that say, do not litter, do not step on the lawn. These are acts that citizens can commit but should not, and that is what the authorities order them to do. That no, of the commandments, means, you cannot, no matter how hard you try. That it is useless and absurd, that you keep on believing that you can do it, because you will not succeed. 
My master used to say that the no of the Pentateuch is equivalent, in today's language, to someone saying, you will not swim across the Atlantic Ocean. Why? Because you already know, you can't even try. You do not possess the strength. The material body has no will of its own. It can neither oppose nor command. Life is in the spirit, in the soul, in the higher self. When it leaves the body of flesh and bone, only the inert mass remains, without life. So you could put a dagger in so-and-so's body, you could pour cyanide in so-and-so's coffee, and their bodies would cease to exist on the earthly plane. But they would continue to be full of life, and conscious on the plane that follows, and all you would have accomplished, is to make the law of rhythm, on its return, strike you. You will die by the hand of another or by, accident. The well-known sayings, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, from the Bible, and the popular one, he who kills with iron, dies with iron, are not myths. Only it is not God who punishes, as it is believed, but his laws, his principle governs in all the universes, and in all the planes, both to retribute the good, and to collect the evil. Not for nothing is it said that, order is the first law of heaven, and Jesus said, even the very hairs of your head are numbered. Now you will see better that no evil can come to you from the outside. No one can harm you if it does not appear in your memory that you have done a similar harm to another. No one can kill your reputation, nor your business, nor your happiness, nor your home, nor any other belonging of yours, nor can you kill any of these in another, nor are there accidents or coincidences. The great laws protect you. Already the great majority, feel incapable of murdering your neighbor. It is already a lot. But now comes the second aspect of the commandment, to tell us that it is useless, to try to harm another or their belongings, by means of slander, gossip, lies or the trick. And that the only thing that is achieved with that is that the law returns the same evil to the one who tries it. The boomerang inevitably returns to the point where it was launched. And now with respect to killing an insect or an animal, common sense is the way to do it. Common sense is the way in which divine wisdom is expressed through man. Learn this maxim by heart. Repeat it and remember it, every time you are faced with a doubtful circumstance. Stop now and repeat it, until it sticks in your mind. We are the elder brothers of every manifestation of life inferior to our own. Life is all one, expressing itself through everything it can animate. Insects, birds and all other animals are potential human beings. They are in the early stages of their evolution, and over the course of many, many millennia, accumulating substance and materials, experiences and practices, ascending from form to form, from kingdom to kingdom. Eventually they will succeed in materializing all this, in the outer form of a human being. You almost never go backwards. That is to say, you can park and delay, deviate and choose a different path, but the example of not going backwards is never given by our earth. It never retraces its steps. It took millions of years to transform itself from a nebula into a planet, and then to produce living beings. The day never returns from 7 o'clock at night to 12 o'clock on the same day. Man cannot destroy his essence to be reborn as an animal. Taking all this into account, when observing a living animal, we should feel a deep compassion, when considering the effort it is making, and the cost involved in learning to move. As well as adapting and unwinding, in its tiny one-dimensional world, and that by gutting it with our foot, we are cutting it short of its minuscule, yet valuable experience. You will learn this better, in the principle of vibration. But, and it is a very big but, divine wisdom, through common sense, makes us judges, even if we are the elder brothers. Let's say that one day in our clean, tidy and neat house, a cockroach or a fluke appears. I'm tired, to see you take the leap with the shoe in hand, and, grack. The poor thing perished. And now you will tell me, but, am I going to let my house be flooded with those animals? 
Not at all. You cannot, nor should you allow it to remain even a second more, under your own bed. You, as an elder brother, have the duty to watch over, to teach, to correct and to restrain your younger brothers. You may not allow them to increase unduly, nor may you allow them to enter a place where they do not belong. Nor should you allow another, not even an irrational little animal, to abuse you. If you allow it, you do wrong. But for that you have the mind, which these beings do not yet have, and that is why Moses said in Genesis, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him. Notice that the latter is said three times. When the Bible repeats it three times, it means that the phrase has the same meaning on all three levels. In other words, that there is no metaphysical or hieroglyphic interpretation to be sought, and that it expresses an eternal and fundamental truth. Now, animals, or irrational beings, do not have a spirit, let us say, individual. They have what we call, group spirit, that is, that the great group of each species forms a spirit, or perhaps it is not, but a particle of a spirit. That I cannot know. I have not reached those heights. What is certain is that they, the irrational beings, act in group, and by already determined lines of action. An example of this is the bees. One type of bees obeys the instinct to build honeycombs of wax. Another to the instinct to tend the queen, and so on. These are automatic actions. They individually do not think, but the great set that signs a mind thinks for it, and guides them by means of the instinct, we could say. Using the law of correspondence, we see how this mechanical action of the bees corresponds to a similar situation in the human kingdom. In the construction of a building, for example, there are boys who carry water. There are bricklayers who glue bricks. There are carpenters who make doors, or there are workers specialized in moldings, paintings, ornaments. They all work almost mechanically, each in his particular line, and all fulfilling something that is in the mind of the architect. In man, what corresponds? The feet do the automatic work of walking. The hands, to maneuver, the eyes, to look. The ears to listen, etc. And everything obeys the impulse sent by the mind, through lines, which we call nerves in man. Knowing this, when you find an insect out of place, restrain your first impulse to annihilate it. The spirit of its group is on the same mental level with you, it is part of the universal mind, you contact it by directing your mind toward it. Simply say to it, here is a cell of yours, which is out of ITS environment. It is not harmonious to my environment. God is perfect harmony. Take it away. You will feel a great emotion, when you see the insect stop motionless, as if receiving the wave, and a minute later it runs to disappear. You will not see it again. And in case your own conscience is not yet sure of the truth that I have just taught you, either you feel doubts about the result, or you do the treatment with too much violence, and you see that the animal continues to bother you, give it three chances. Tell the group spirit, if you don't take it away soon, I will have T.O. kill it. Generally, you will not have to kill it. In very few cases does he resist leaving. Only when he himself is looking for death, because he has already lived his life, and in that case, when your common sense, which is the divine wisdom in you, indicates it to you, kill him with a strong and dry blow. Do not leave it half alive, or in agony. And without violence of your spirit, without anger or disgust, tell it, may you evolve into a better species. It all depends on the intention and thought, with which it is executed. There are sects and orders of those who call themselves, occultists, who do not eat meat. They allege that the vibrations of pain of the animal when it is killed, contaminate the human soul, and they also allege that the vibrations of the inferior species, degrade the being. The Master Jesus denied this belief, 
when he said, It is not what goes into his mouth that defile a man, but what comes out of his mouth, for what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. You already knew the explanation of this lesson, in the chapter, The Decree. And according to Moses we repeat, Nobody nor anything can harm us from outside, unless we have deserved it, unless we accept it by believing it is possible. But when we know this truth, and remember it always, nothing and no one can cause us any harm. The taste for eating meat, or the need for meat as food, only means that the individual still retains, an amount of his animal nature, carnivorous animal, it is understood. He has not yet reached the point where his cells, are able to do without food ingested from the outside, that's all. Because the obligatory limitation to eat fruits and vegetables is not a proof of spiritual elevation, since the cow and the horse only eat grass and grains. As soon as one begins to study metaphysics, the cells of the body begin to cleanse themselves, because one begins to live in a mental spiritual world. And according to the principle of correspondence, as below so above, as above so below. The whole being evolves at the same time. The student realizes, sooner or later, that he begins to not need meat as food, and even comes to abhor it, without anything or anyone forcing him to do so. Something very important, when you study the principle of vibration, you will be able to verify the scientific truth that it is impossible for a lower frequency vibration to dominate a higher frequency vibration. The animal vibrates on a lower plane than man, how can it ever affect man? Only on one condition, that man is ignorant of the principle of vibration, and believes it possible to be affected by the vibrations of the animal. By believing this, he is accepting it, and therefore submitting to a law inferior to himself. It is for this very reason that one cannot kill. Life is positive. Death is negative, that is, it is the negation of life. Life is indestructible. You cannot kill, no matter how hard you try. Chapter 8 Thou shalt not steal. And you know the second, metaphysical or higher aspect of this commandment. You can never steal, nor try to. Don't bother to even dream of it. It is impossible. No one can take from you something that belongs to you. They may try, they may try to take something from you or from your house, and while you are ignorant of the law, and therefore believe that you can be robbed, the object may be lost to you. But once you know the law, remember it and repeat its truth, you will never be robbed again, and nothing will ever be lost or misplaced. Check it out for yourself. Don't believe me blindly, until you have checked the next time you find something you think is lost. It is one of the easiest lessons to learn. Your body today, contains all the primitive substances of our planet. Earth, water, and air. In addition, all the substances, all the elements, come from these. Likewise, you have to your credit all that you accumulated, of experiences and knowledge, in your thousands and thousands of years, living under one or the other. But the first thing you learned was to eat, and to look for food, when you were a larva in the water. When after many paths, you came to move your little legs to walk on land. Eating, digesting, and the movement of your limbs became acquired rights. You could not and will never lose those acquired skills. Each acquired knowledge or skill automatically gives you the right to occupy a place that is more advanced than the previous one. Now you see why you cannot retrograde to a lower place. How? If it is the law of evolution in addition to the law of attraction, which makes everything attracts its equal, and rejects its opposite? This is part of the principle of polarity, which is unbreakable like all principles. Although, when you start a new life, you have to learn again, what you have already acquired in the previous ones, such as walking, talking, eating, etc. This is only apparent. What actually happens is that the being has to remember. Not to relearn, because the child eats, moves, cries, laughs, sees, hears, blood circulates, etc., all because it already has the subconscious. All because it is already in the subconscious. 
The talents, the genius, the boy who is too lazy to study, all the above skills, and they are much easier for him than others, who try them for the first time. However, the intelligent young man and disinterested in studies, is simply demonstrating, that he finds it boring to have to repeat, what he has already gone through in a previous life, or even in several previous lives. It is not necessary to worry about that. It is necessary to leave it there so that it remembers, what it has stored in the subconscious. Generally it happens that at the time of the exams, the child learns what is necessary to pass calmly, and on a par with all the others, who have killed studying during the whole year. This confuses parents and teachers, but it is one of the proofs in favor of the theory of reincarnation. Reincarnation does exist, but it is not obligatory. Free will exists for everything and in everything. Just as on earth, each individual appropriate or desperate opportunities, according to his character or desire. In the astral plane, the realm of disembodied souls or spirits, each one is free to take advantage or not, this resource that is offered to advance. Just as humans are free to choose a profession or a line of study, to strive for their own development, or to simply live without purpose or ambition. So are souls free to return to the earth plane, to take another step forward, or to acquire new experiences. They are also free to pay back loans, called karmas, or to collect deserved goods, or if they like the life they are leading, they can stay in it for as long as it suits them. Nobody forces them. However, at the end of the day, the advancement and well-being of others motivates them to yearn for the same for themselves. And the currency with which this is purchased is effort, knowledge and experience, which are acquired in the active life on earth. Every knowledge and every experience, remain forever as possessions acquired, bought and paid for. These possessions we say are acquired, by right of consciousness, and can neither be lost nor stolen. No one can take away one's intelligence, talent, faculties and knowledge. But what is even more extraordinary, is that as every acquisition is made through experience, and that experience is accompanied by objects, instruments, furniture, money, properties, etc. Everything that has been used in life, in an experience, everything that has been learned to use, as the bed, the table, cutlery, crockery, clothing, jewelry, money, etc. Even a pack of matches remains in essence, or as photographic negatives, recorded and archived in our individual assets, by right of consciousness. And these, properties, or possessions, we bring them along with us, in each reincarnation. They appear in our lives, whether we like it or not, and this is what makes some people to be born in opulence, and others in misery. One is born where one has deserved to be born, by right of conscience. The law is in charge, to attract each one to its sphere. To its own place. There is no injustice on the plane of truth. To this law the Master Jesus referred, when he said, Do not make yourselves treasures on earth, where the moth burns, and where thieves mine and mock. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust corrupts, nor thieves steal and rob. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be, Matthew 6.21. But of course, like all biblical maxims, this one also has three degrees of significance. The first material, the second mental, and the third spiritual. As you will see from all that has been said, there is no reason to live in fear of thieves. If up to now you have lived in fear that your possessions may be stolen, that thieves may enter your house at night, or when you are absent from your home. Or because you have believed in swindles and swindlers, etc., you can now live in peace. You can now live in peace. No one can take from you even a pin, which belongs to you by right of conscience, because if you possess it, it is because you deserved it in remote lives. And if the attempt is made against you, if through your own fear that it may persist, while you acquire the practice of the new consciousness, someone steals from you, or you lose some object, pronounce immediately the truth, nothing that is mine by right of consciousness, can be lost or stolen. Keep calm 
Think no more, and you will see how you find your possession, someone returns it to you, someone gives you one just like it, or you find a similar one. All your possessions are in your mental archive, like the original of a document, reproducing the copy on the outside. It cannot be separated from you. Thou shalt not steal, you cannot even try. Do not blindly believe anything, from what you just read. See for yourself first. By their fruits ye shall know them. Chapter 9 Thou shalt not bear false witness. Many people are surprised that Moses did not devote a separate place to lying among the Ten Commandments and think that there should be an eleventh, which says, Thou shalt not lie. Then they are satisfied with thinking that perhaps lying is included in this commandment number nine. What happens is that lying was included and dealt with extensively in commandments number one, two, and three, as we shall see below. And not only was lying not disqualified by Moses as unimportant, but the entire separate bearship is a metaphysical exposition of the truth and an accusation against the appearance and false beliefs that humanity accumulates. Is it for lack of a specific ordinance, in this code of behavior, that humans continue to lie at their convenience and whim? Now is that they will know what they are doing. Thou shalt not bear false witness, refers directly to the spoken word. You can never establish a falsehood, not only because the truth will cry out and disprove the false, but the law returns the trick, and will destroy the one who tries to raise it. At election time, we see how the parties try, by all means, to discredit each other, casting slander, false testimony and in infamy. The winner enters to govern, sure that he has defeated the other. In reality what he has done is to accumulate testimonies of his own falsehood. By their fruits you shall know them, or as Emerson said, what you are screamed so loud, I do not hear what you tell me. For what the commandment says, is that your own concept, is what you see. If you find what you see beautiful, it is because your eyes reflect the cleanliness, purity and truth in your soul. If what you see you declare ugly, your words translate and betray your own falsehood. You will not bear false witness. No matter how hard you try, you will not be able to do so, for you will be mentioning yourself and not your neighbor. In the first part you learned, that the true, I, is perfect, is beautiful with all the virtues and beauties of its creator, since it was created from the very essence of the Father. You also learned that this, I, is the truth, my truth, your truth and everyone's truth, and if we are manifesting the opposite, it means that we do not yet know our own creative power, which is thought. What we think manifests itself outwardly, and by learning to think, we begin to correct the outward proof. Our ignorance is not proof that the Father has not been able to educate us. It is only proof that we are still children in the Father's home. If you give your child a ball of clay to make dolls with, you don't expect him to produce a work of art, do you? But little by little he will learn, won't he? Now you are learning, that you have a series of mental errors. What happens to you in life and in your body, is the result of a series. That is to say, that your inner and outer world are the mirror that reflects the state of your mind and soul, and that nothing different can happen to you than what your mind projects. If you want to see it differently, you have to change your ideas and your way of thinking. The principle of correspondence says, as above, so below. As below is above, that is, what happens to you on the earth plane, indicates how your mind plane is going. You also learned already the truth, and that by comparing what you see with that truth, you will know if what you are creating, projecting your thought, is the truth and the good, or if it is a false testimony. You already know that by recognizing the difference, the false testimony begins to transform. By thinking and declaring the truth, you will see the lie erased as if by magic, for it has neither power nor life of its own, other than what your belief and thought give it. Know the truth, and it shall set you free, said Jesus. The truth is that your I is perfect, as is every creation of the Father. It is a child of God. 
If you consider yourself ugly, bad, sinful, defective, guilty, then you manifest it. But these are false testimonies, and by understanding it, denying it outright, and affirming the truth of your being, you begin to manifest it, and to see the false testimony in you, and in everything that happens to you and surrounds you. That false testimony, like all lies, is cured with the truth. That is to say, it is false and cannot affect or attack the truth, no matter how hard you try. When the churches speak of offending God, it is even laughable. God cannot be offended by anything or anyone. One may try, but without the slightest result. Nothing can break a principle. Besides, it would be as if the infinitesimal scratch that an ant makes when climbing a mountain could cause pain to the mountain. Chapter 10 Thou shalt not covet. When an idea emerges from the divine mind, it already contains in itself, all that may be necessary for its development. It is not conceivable that God is capable of devising, and that he sends it to us incomplete so that we rack our brains, and we go crazy looking for a solution, that only he knows. That would be typical of a crossword puzzle, specially made to kill time. But never of the infinite wisdom, love and justice, especially when it comes to the evolution of a life that he himself has caused. The universe is based on order. The perfect harmony between all its parts, is verifiable at the simple sight of the sun, and the earth rotating to receive all of it, the benefit that he dispenses. When this knowledge is acquired, there is never again a lack of anything that is necessary. When you have a surplus of something, it is because there is another who needs it. Nature hates emptiness. The air itself, the space, is full of atoms of all species, waiting for the opportunity to form something, at the right moment. Life lives looking for the opportunity to animate. This is its task, and she does not waste a favorable slit to enter. Leave a little soil, in any place that can receive moisture, and soon you will see a green spikelet peeping out. If you leave a glass of water forgotten, it won't take long for it to fill up with living larvae. Before the womb of a woman conceives a child, everything is prepared in the womb to receive the germ, to secure it, to nourish and protect it, until it can deliver a whole and complete human being. The egg of an insect, a reptile or a bird, already contains all that it requires for its formation, a creature meticulously equipped to develop in its proper kingdom. The same thing happens with vegetable seeds. So, if there is such a loving will, such a foreseen tenderness, such a careful and meticulous attention, in order to prepare and take care of the little details that one day will form a man. That man can lack nothing. Everything is foreseen, and everything is already created at the disposal of that man. Thou shalt not covet, says the commandment. That is, you do not have to envy what belongs to another, nor crave for it, nor resign yourself to not possessing it. The same exists for you, and it is already yours. You don't even have to fight for it. It is enough to ask for it, to claim it, and to give thanks beforehand, so that you will see it appear. Doesn't the Bible make it clear? He that asketh receiveth, he that seeketh findeth, to him that knocketh it shall be opened. And why don't you take it seriously? The size of a longing, or the measure of your need, indicates the degree of power that the gift is exerting, to enter your life. Because it is a gift, and you don't have to pay for it. When you feel the need, it means that it is already paid or deserved. The moment you were waiting for has come, and the time has come for you to take advantage of it. So you can ask for it, but first give thanks. It may come to you by natural earthly ways, or by a helping hand, or it may come to you as a miracle. It may fall from the clouds, as it happened to me on one occasion, when I was in New Orleans, without knowing a soul, my money ran out while I was waiting for a money order that was delayed. I had not a cent left in my wallet, and it was Saturday afternoon. There was no bank open until Monday. But I knew the truth, and declared, my world contains everything, there is nothing lacking in creation. 
Thank you Father, you have heard me. At that moment, I saw a green paper fluttering in the wind on the street, coming towards me. It hit my ankle, and as I looked down, I realized that it was a five dollar bill. No doubt it had slipped out of someone's hand. I waited with the bill in my hand, in case I noticed someone looking for it. That money, in a miraculous way, was enough to pay for a cab, which took me to the bank on Monday, where my money order was waiting for me. Miracles do not happen because a principle has been broken, as the church is naively believed, but precisely because the action of the principle is used. The principle is studied, known and the rules of the law are applied, that is to say, the principle is acted upon. Because no principle can ever bend to condescend, nor bend to make exceptions. My master used to say that if the principle of gravity were to stop for an instant to prevent a very important man from dying when he fell to the ground after jumping from a top floor, it would not be a miracle, but universal chaos. Chapter 11 The First Commandment The first three commandments are one. All three refer to the same thing, and say thus. I am the Lord thy God, who brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. 2. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. 3. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them, for I am the Lord thy God, the Lord thy God, a jealous God, which seat the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate. And I shew mercy unto thousands, to them that love and keep my commandments. 4. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. The first thing to remember is that when the Bible repeats a point three times, it means that it is to be taken in the sense of the letter, and not symbolically. Besides, this sense is the same in the three planes of consciousness, material, mental and spiritual. In this commandment, appears three times the mention of, Jehovah, your God. The first mention refers to God, creator of everything. The second refers to the law, or principle. The third refers to the, higher self, of each one of us, who is one with God, one with the principle. In other words, three aspects of the same entity and power are presented here. Egypt is the symbol of matter. Of the primitive man who has not yet reached the degree of being able to understand or accept the concept of a unique, invisible God. The Egyptians worshipped many gods, idols formed invisible. Hermes took the first step, to instill in them the idea of a single God. As a first effort, it served as an impulse but did not assert itself. They fell back to their accustomed beliefs, and Moses came to give them a new impulse. For this reason he says, I am Jehovah, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. In the earthly interpretation for the material plane, and for the followers of Moses in the Exodus, this commanded to do as it says. That a unique God had delivered them from slavery, in the houses of their Egyptian masters, that this new God was called Jehovah, and that they should not continue to serve him, their old idols. In sentence, too, he stipulates the forms of these idols, that is, that he forbids them to worship images, animals, fish. In sentence, three, he speaks to them very clearly. He forbids them to worship and honor their painted dolls. And that he will punish, not only the disobedient, but also his children, grandchildren and descendants, but that he will have mercy on those who obey him. This situation is so childish, that the coming generations express their discontent, in front of this obvious injustice, which led the prophet Ezekiel, to clarify and revoke such a measure. This shows how the human mind, was developing and finding puerile, some points of those orders of Moses. For us, the metaphysical meaning is already clear. I am God, 
who took you out of the material concept. Do not attribute powers to anything other than me, and do not forge mental images. Do not fear them nor respect them, nor form your judgments, according to what you see on the outside, above in the sky, nor below on the earth, nor in the waters beneath the earth. For the law will deliver to you what your errors command, those who hate me, and will correct your manifestations, as you employ the truth, I show mercy to those who love me, and keep my commandments. With the passage of time, the Hebrews adopted a literal interpretation of the scriptures, to the point that in their synagogues, we do not even find a visual representation. They became overwhelmed with all the obligations listed in Leviticus. To the point, that the Levites lived with a guilt complex, as it was humanly impossible for them to fulfill, with the six hundred odd rituals and daily details, to which they thought they were committed. The Bible is a psychological and metaphysical treatise. It is the Book of Truth. And it does not command, it only explains. It contains an explanation and advice for every circumstance of life, on every plane of consciousness. Number 4. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain, refers directly to what you already know, do not condemn yourself by your words. Do not say that you are ugly, bad, negative, do not appropriate harmful conditions, which you later regret to see manifested, such as, my bad memory, my sick heart, my limp, my poor eyesight, etc. For all this is to take the name of Jehovah, your God, in vain, and the law does not forgive, it will not consider innocent, what is decreed in the name of I. You will have given a command, which the subconscious will do everything possible to fulfill, in all your circumstances, up to the third and fourth generation. Chapter 12 Thou shalt not fornicate. In principle, this word was not the one Moses used or wrote. What he said was, Thou shalt not commit adultery, and that was the first adultery that was committed, in transcribing the Ten Commandments, that of arbitrarily adulterating the truth. Moses being an advanced, a sage, an expert in the knowledge of the Hermetic principles, it was utterly impossible for him to instruct, trying to circumvent the principle of generation. The word constitutes an offense, an insult to human intelligence, in that place where the scribes placed it, by order of ignorant ecclesiastical authorities. The same substitution was crudely made in the writings of the Apostle and Evangelist Matthew, chapter 19, verses 4 to 12. To every connoisseur of the principles, the biblical substitutions are obvious. Like all principles, the principle of generation functions automatically, on all planes, and on each plane it acts, in the manner appropriate to the plane. In the atomic kingdom, one atom joins with another to give birth to an element, by the law of attraction, cohesion and adhesion. And these three are natural conditions of the principle of generation, that is, they are an integral part of the principle. Nothing would have been created, nothing would be produced, nothing would be born and nothing would evolve, if the electronic principle of magnetism, that is to say, the attraction between the positive and the negative, could be destroyed. Adhesion and cohesion are born after attraction. Adhesion is the self-determination of the atom, in other words, the free will that contains every atom, to accept or refuse to join another atom, whether or not its type. Cohesion is the faculty of sticking to each other, in such a degree of force, that I need not remind you what happens, when you manage to separate the particles of an atom, the atomic bomb. I suppose you have seen in what you have just read, the similarity to what happens, between us humans. This similarity illustrates to perfection, the principle of correspondence, as above, so below, as below, so above. That is to say, by studying the monad, one arrives at the angel, as the Kybalian expresses it. The principles act automatically, above all and in spite of everything, whatever we can do against it. If atoms were already human beings, or if they spoke in our words, they would call this process of attraction, adhesion and cohesion, fornication, wouldn't they? 
The same thing would be in the botanical and zoological kingdoms, where a bee transfers pollen from one flower to another, and from that union a new species is born, wouldn't it? Now think, if it is in the designs of God the Creator, to prevent or prohibit these processes. It is known that when a principle is resisted, the force that impels it is multiplied, and it looks for the exit by other conduits, that is to say, that the only thing that is achieved is to force it to deviate, it is not possible to stop it. In the animal kingdom, the principle of generation is called sex. As long as humans continue to reproduce, by the process called sexual, they are proving that a part of their system has not yet left the animal kingdom. And once their cells, evolve to the immediately higher realm, where the principle of generation, manifests itself in a different form, man and woman, cannot act like animals. They are no longer in that realm, and they are not dominated by the lower influence. They do not feel sexual desires, nor the desire to eat meat. It is another order of things. At this point, the disciples always ask, and if we all evolve, then the human race is finished. No, why? Are there always thousands of thousands of beings coming behind us, who have to go through the animal kingdom? You graduate, your generation graduates, all human beings gradually graduate, but others keep coming, eternally. Jesus said, you will always have the poor with you. He was referring not only to the economically poor, but also to the poor in knowledge, the poor in experience, the poor in evolution. It also says in the Apocalypse, that the Lord announced for this age that, no more children would be born. That was announced for the human sector of his time, which is the same that evolves today. That time is approaching. We know it by the following, and by many other signs, the darkest hour is before dawn. The dying man gets better just before he dies. The sick get worse just before they are cured. The population of the earth, increases everywhere, in an extraordinary way. Soon it will begin to decline. One of Jesus' answers to his disciples, referring to the time of the end of the old world, and the entrance of the new world was, when the mantle of shame falls. This means, when the truth is universally known. The truth of the principles we are learning, and most especially, the truth they tried to adulterate, with that false title of, Thou shalt not fornicate. For by attracting human attention and focusing it, opposing at the same time, a prohibition or a resistance, they precisely defrauded their purpose, as we exposed above. The impulse of the principle of generation multiplied, and seeking its way out, it was diverted. Thus we can see the terrible effects. It is the commandment that has been most broken, that has caused the greatest number of abuses, of mental distortions and sexual aberrations, of physical evils, of dishonors, shames and punishments. All for the arbitrary substitution of a word. You have all seen, those dwarf Japanese saplings, twisted and distorted to an incredible degree. We see them as a curiosity, and as such we admire them, but this does not detract from the fact that they are an outrage against nature. As is a caged bird, or a tethered animal. We also all know that the forbidden, acquires an attraction out of all proportion. This is what happened with all the attempts to curb the principle of generation, such as giving the Adam's apple a sexual interpretation, adulterating and adding to the inspired texts. All out of ignorance, in an effort to exercise dominion or power over others. The metaphysical meaning of the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, is precisely, do not misinterpret the laws because you will not succeed. In other words, the effect will be the opposite of what you want, and the law itself will contradict what you have said. For the Master Jesus, fanatical dogmatism was even more repugnant and more worthy of punishment than sexual licentiousness. And so he expressed it when he said, Woe to you Chorazin, woe to you Bethsaida, I tell you that Tyre and Sidon will be more tolerable punishment than you. Chorazin and Bethsaida were biblical towns. Every town or city name in the Bible is a symbol. These two names symbolize dogmatism and fanaticism. 
Tyre and Sidon symbolize sexual deviations. So he said textually, that to the sexual sins, the punishment would be more tolerable, than to dogmatism and fanaticism. In other words, religious fanatics would be more severely punished than harlots. Returning to the reference I made at the beginning of this chapter, Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 to 12, I will copy it in full. Then came the Pharisees unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for any cause whatsoever? He answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. They said to him, Then, why did Moses command to give a bill of divorcement and to put her away? And he said to them, Because of the hardness of your hearts, Moses permitted you to put away your wives, but at first it was not so. And I say to you, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another, commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. The ecclesiastical scribes added the clause, except for fornication, on their own initiative and responsibility. They had to put in a little word anyway, and it became meaningless to them, as time went on, and in the light of the higher teachings. His disciples said to him, If such is the condition of a man with his wife, it is not fitting to marry. Then he said to them, Not everyone is able to receive this, but those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs, who were so born from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who are made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who make themselves eunuchs, for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Whoever is able to receive this, let him receive it. If you are able to receive it, you will have seen the principle of generation exposed, up to the point of mentioning Moses. The original explanation was undoubtedly longer and more detailed, since the disciples understood and gave the comment, if such is the condition of a man with his wife, it is not fitting to marry. Or what is the same, there is no point in marrying, if from the beginning they were made one. In other words, when the positive and negative poles come together, there is no separating them. Each cell that comes out of the bosom of God, is half positive and half negative, that is, in the language of humans, and in the human plane, the primitive cell, or the original Adam, is feminine and masculine. Shortly after evolving, the two sexes are separated, and continue to evolve each on their own side. Until the final meeting, at the end of the 14,000 years, which are needed to acquire spiritual consciousness. These two sexes are separate, independent entities, destined to form a couple, one day. However, there are those who do not wish to separate. These are the ones Jesus called, eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. It is highly comforting for anyone who is lonely on the road of life, or who considers himself or herself unhappy and unmarried, to know that on some plane, incarnate or disincarnate, it doesn't matter, but there is that, he, or, she. The perfect other half of everyone, waiting to join their soul mate, and that we have every right that we have, to claim that union. If our soul mate is disembodied, we will be united on the other plane. If it is incarnated, nothing and no one else can keep us apart. The law arranges everything harmoniously for everyone, if we ask for it, in accordance with divine will, under grace, and in a perfect way. And that other half of us is exactly what we seek and desire. What suits us by perfect affinity? Many times, in past lives we have met, we have united, and it is that memory, which makes us live looking for it. The doctrines erroneously fabricated by humans, have inserted a law that says, what God has united, let no man separate. It is exact, but the interpretation is wrong. It is believed that this refers to the marriage performed in a church, with words pronounced by the authorized religious. This is not so. We have already seen that it refers to the original union of the primitive couple, symbolized by Adam and Eve. And it is not a threat against divorce, which is simply a human solution. But it is a consolation, offered by the infinite tenderness of God, our Father, 
as if to comfort us by telling us, Do not be afraid my son, you have your love forever and ever. Jesus lived consciously on a higher plane, for it was difficult for him to come down and speak on the human plane. That is why he taught through so many parables, because their meaning does not vary, it is the same on all planes. The meaning of a parable is never subject to the words that are in fashion or in use. The reference to the eunuchs is almost a parable. It can be taken in the human sense, if so desired. In the scientific sense it refers to neutrons, which have no positive or negative charge. Metaphysically, those who become eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven, are humans who, like all of you, yearn to elevate themselves, learn and study, that which relates to the higher planes. But as the Master said, he who is able to receive this, let him receive it. Notice that the great Masters avoid going into detail when speaking of this commandment. They do as Jesus did, they say something cryptic, and let him who is able to understand it understand it. Why? Because the mind of this fifth root race, which is us, is evolving between two planes. It still has a great animal part, and the animal neither rationalizes nor knows how to control itself. If it is given the green light, it overflows, and if it is given the red light, it fulminates itself. It is a point of equilibrium very difficult to maintain. Let us thank the Father that we are already with one foot up, to climb the next step, and let us remember the episode of Jesus, when they came to present a woman to him, who was caught in flagrant adultery. And who, according to the laws of Israel, should be stoned to death. The master did not answer a syllable. He began to play with a finger in the dirt at her feet. The men who had brought her, withdrew one by one, and being left alone, Jesus asked the woman, Woman, where are your accusers? She replied, I do not know, Lord. Then Jesus said, Neither do I accuse you. Go in peace. Thank you for joining us on this transformative journey through Metaphysics for Everyone, by Connie Mendez. May the wisdom you've gained continue to illuminate your path and enrich your life. Remember, the power to create your reality lies within you. Farewell, and may your journey be filled with love, light, and boundless possibilities. Thank you.